I guess the question has been asked before, but I'm going to ask it again. What is the truth? How do you come to the knowledge of the truth in a world of lies? Let's talk about that. We don't have to live in confusion. The question is, how do we know the truth? And that's kind of the premise of what I want to talk to you about. It's, it's bothering me as I see so many people and, and receive so many comments. In fact, just today, I received comments. The more that I dug into what they were saying, I realized that they were coming from a Mormon position that does not recognize the same God that we recognize, and that's a fact. That's the truth. Another comment that I received was coming from a Luciferian point of view. So the comment seemed good until you dug into it and you begin to realize that they were actually talking about a satanic God. And so the truth wasn't there. Of course, what do I do with those? I'm not going to leave them on my comment lines. I nix them. I send them into <laughs> comment oblivion. I mean, and that's, that's what I do. Besides all of the comments that come that are just downright wicked and vile and, and um, you know, that's just the nature of things. Why? Because we're living in a time of deception. I want to read some scripture that just sets the stage for the fact that this is a time of deception and and this was what was to be expected. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 5. And so Jesus answered and said to them, take heed, and this is first, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they'll deceive many. The, the word Christ there, of course, is Christos, which doesn't necessarily translate always to being Christ as in the name um, the title of Jesus being the Christ. Christos means anointed. And so many will come claiming that they're anointed by God, that the words that they're speaking are the anointed words of God. And we see that everywhere today. There are prophetic voices, prophetic voices out there that are prophesying so many things and saying that they are anointed to prophesy them. And then they go so far as to say, if you criticize them, then you are breaking the word, which says, touch not the Lord's anointed, which wasn't meant for them. It was meant for the fathers of Israel. Touch not God's anointed. You see, there's a problem. There is a large segment of the church world today that is either asleep, another large uh, section of the church world is quite literally prophetically deceived. If I might note, I watched one pastor. Uh, I even hesitate to say this, but one pastor prophesied before his congregation that by the end of July, the entire economy I guess he was talking about the world. Maybe he was just talking about the United States of America, but he was talking about the economy and the financial wealth of America would be transferred into the hands of the people of God. His congregation was eating it up. And I admit there was a part of me that said, man, I hope I get some of that. But then it just was like, that was the flesh. <laughs> Why, why is he prophesying that? Why are they prophesying things like we're, we're going to see this massive awakening and justice is coming on the earth and, and America is going to be great again and America's spiritual Israel? And why? Because of deception, pure and simple. Sadly, true. They're deceived. There's a reason for that. We'll get to that in just a minute. And I can say that. I can say that with 
with sadness in my heart that so many are deceived because there is a way we can know the truth. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, that because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many would grow cold. The love of many would grow cold. The love of God in people's hearts, or even the love for the word of God, the love for the truth, the love the love of uh, uh, loving one another, according to the word of God, would grow cold. We see that in the church. And I, and I believe he's talking about the church world. He's talking to the Jews, talking to the church, talking to the atmosphere of the world. And that day would be a loss of love, a lack of love. And I believe the loss of the love of truth is, is quite evident. It's quite evident. Confusion has replaced truth. Deception has replaced truth. The search after the truth has turned into the search after confusion and living in confusion. Second Peter chapter two, verses one through three said, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Now I'm accused of being a false teacher because I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I'm convinced of it. It's all over the scripture. No, the word isn't in the Bible, it, at least not rapture, uh, but rapture is a substitute word for what the Greek says. Okay, I'm not going to go into all that again. You need to do your research and not put your comment down saying rapture is not the Bible. That literally, and I say this with love, that literally is an ignorant comment. Stop living in ignorance. Study your word. The typology has been removed from the scripture. The types and shadows, which all picture what it's going to look like. It's seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, rescue, deliverance, rescue, deliverance, seven years, seven years. It's over and over and over again. And yet, because the truth has been ignored, then all kinds of deceptive doctrines are coming in. So there'll be false teachers among you who will secretly bring you bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves self-destruction. Many will follow their sensuality. Because of them, the way the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, I'm talking about prosperity teachers here, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Sadly, this is alive in the church. It's not well, it's sick, but it's alive in the church. Deception, greed, false doctrine, destructive heresies. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. We're there. Oh, we are there. If you, if you were looking at it from a worldly standpoint, a fleshly standpoint, if you're a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ, know the gospel, and doesn't have the expected hope of a soon of the soon appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, then you're living in perilous times. It's perilous times for the world. It's peril, and we're living in peril. I watched, pardon me, I read this morning the latest from the New York City Emergency Management Committee. Last week, they put out a video. Many of you saw that video. It was a real cute public information on how to survive a nuclear blast. May I just be somewhat sarcastic how stupid that is? Today, yesterday, actually, they, uh, they came out with uh, their second, but not a video, but public information on how to evacuate the city in an orderly manner and have a go bag ready to go. For you, your family, even in your even your pets, to be able to have a go bag ready to go at all times in case there is an emergency, whether it's from the ocean, a hurricane, or some sort of toxic event. Is it fear mongering or does the enemy actually know that something is coming? I don't know. My wife and I had that discussion this morning. Is it fear mongering? Yeah. Is it... Um, it <laughs> Is it a point where they're saying things so that people become accustomed to the fact it could happen and they really don't care? And then when it comes up and hits them, it strikes them unaware? I don't know. I don't know. I do know this, that, that we have right now peril in this world. 
For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You've read this before. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such people turn away for... Of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Who? The women, the, the gullible, the, the, those who don't study the word of God on their own are so susceptible, are so gullible to these prophetic voices, these prophets who are, who are making it all seem so good. They've They've delved into the, to the uh, deception that somehow all of, uh, all of the promises to Israel fall upon the church. And by the way, the United States is the center of the church. What utter nonsense. <laughs> utter nonsense. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Let's look at the word. We're talking the word here. The coming of the lawless one, and he is coming. He's here. He's here. The, the events that will reveal him are about to happen. And, of course, the major event that has to happen before he can be revealed is the departure. Some would look at it as departure from the faith. Others look at it as the departure of the church. And that is confirmed within 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that talks about the departure, that the restraining influence, the restrainer has to be removed before the Antichrist can be revealed. The restrainer, of course, is the Holy Spirit working through the church. Fascinating uh, teachings that have been coming out are that Av9, Av9, pardon me, I said it kind of Southern, Av9. Of nine and ten, days of mourning for Israel because of all the terrible events that took place on those two days from up nine in the evening through up ten the, the, the following day. The fall departure of the first temple took place, 606 BC. And um, it fell on of nine, the second temple, also on of nine and ten. In AD 70. And the latest teaching that's come out, and, and I've looked at it and it's thrilled me because wow, it does make sense. Judgment fell after both of those temples departed. Judgment will fall after the third temple is removed. And who's the third temple? The body of Christ is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Read your scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. No, you not, that you are the temple, the body of Christ. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 6, same thing. So we are living in this time when Scripture is being revealed, and yet there are those who deny it and believe that somehow everything is going to turn around because there's going to be dancing in the streets, and the Spirit of God is going to be poured out on the earth, and, and the earth is going to be won over. The church is going to rise up and take the seven mountains. Well, you know what? The scripture in, in Revelation chapter 18 talks about seven mountains too. And it's the seven mountains where the mystery Babylon sits. Mystery Babylon is going to be destroyed. That doesn't mean the mountains are going to be taken over. It means the deceptive religious spirit of the day is going to be judged. And so these people are not even looking for a rapture. They deny a rapture. They deny this. They're looking for the coming of Messiah. They're, look, they're looking for peace and security to come because they have prayed it in that will they be deceived when the one who stands up and claims himself to be the christ with lying signs and wonders when that one stands up and does the wonders and claims to be christ are they going to be deceived i i hope not i hope not <sighs> With all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who didn't, 
condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That is a harsh verse. Second Timothy chapter four, verses three through five, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Let me tell you, there's a whole segment of the church today that is running after the experience. They're running after the prophetic experience. They have elevated experience above the truth of the word of God. Instead of digging out the word of God and, and seeing the word of God as it really is to be dug into, it, it, it corrects and it rebukes and it brings you into that, that righteousness of God. When you dig into the word of God, they have put experience over the truth and sound doctrine. They have put experience. So if you have enough experiences, then you don't have to qualify it by the truth in their mind. And so they seek after experience. And when you seek after experience and the prophetic experience, then it's very easy to have false prophetic experience and not even realize you're under that deception. I am serious, folks. I see this. And this is the prophesied end. This is what it's going to look like at the end. And we're at the end. Hmm. So the coming of the lawless one, going to be just like that. They're going to heap upon themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful of all things, in all things. Endure afflictions. Wow, where do you hear that preached? That you're going to have afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. That's win people to Jesus and fulfill your ministry. Of course, this is spoken to Timothy who had that calling. So we do too. If you go to the seven churches, we're not going to do that right now, but Revelation chapter two and three, the seven, the letters to the seven churches, four out of those seven were suffering from deception within the church, deception that brought about immorality, the Jezebel spirit, uh, the, the spirit of Balaam, false teaching, false prophecy, all of it. And these churches were experiencing that. And they were challenged by the Lord himself. Repent. Turn away from that or you're going to lose your place. Your lampstand is going to be removed. You see, this is the spirit that is in the church today. Much of the church. I believe all seven are represented right now. And I believe that was the way it was meant to be. Not just seven periods of time between the time of Jesus' ascension until the rapture, but all would be present. All would be present when the end was just about to happen. And we see that taking place. So how do we know the truth? This is the good part. You know, the bad part we've done, and there's so much more I could talk about that's just so heavy. I don't want to be terribly heavy, but you need to be aware. This is the atmosphere we're living in. This is the atmosphere that we're looking and watching for the soon return for, of Jesus for his bride, for the church his body, that will be his bride. Some would say the church is not the bride. Well, go to Revelation chapter 19 and read it. We are caught up into the heavens to the marriage supper of the lamb, and we become the bride. So it's obviously a betrothal that's already happened. Okay. So how do we know the truth? Simple. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, John chapter eight, verses 31 and 32, if you abide in my word, not in the experiences, not in the miracles, not in the signs, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the truth is in abiding in the word of God. Hmm. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus has talked about Father's house. He's talked about many rooms that he's going to go away, prepare, come back, and take us to be with him where he is. And you know the way. And good old Thomas says, we don't know the way. Here's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus, the word of God. In the beginning was the word. Hmm. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among it. Jesus, his word. Second Peter chapter one, verses 19 and 20. Listen to this. 
So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Hmm. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we have the prophetic word. The prophetic word literally is the prophecies of the future. The prophetic word isn't just foretelling. It's not foretelling alone, but in, in this case, the prophetic word was prophesying of the coming of Jesus Christ the first time. It happened. Now the prophesying of the rest of it takes place, and it comes from the Old Testament as well. So we have the sure prophetic word, not the quasi-prophetic words of today. Anybody can stand up and make prophecies about all kinds of things. People want to hear that America is going to be great again. People want to hear. They want to hear that it's going to turn around, that God's going to bless us, that God is going to give revival to us, that God is going to use us again to win the rest of the world, and that this is the basically the center of the church, forgetting that the, the nation has not repented from the horror of sacrificing its children to the, to the altars of, of Moloch, abortion. It's not repented just because the Supreme Court made its decision to turn it back to the states, we see where the real fight is, and we see we see every avenue being explored to continue the murdering of innocents. And God hates. That's one of God's. That's his peeve. I mean, seven things he hates: the murder of innocent blood, the taking of innocent blood, bloodshed of the innocent. God hates it, and He'll judge it, and He's going to judge it. And we're already being judged. And yet it tickles people's ears to think, oh, Trump will come back. Trump's going to come back. And their hope is in a political conservative Christian ideology of somehow turning this nation around. I'm saddened by that. I'm saddened by that. I want to see our nation repent. I want to see people brought to the Lord Jesus Christ, because a nation has repented of its evil, and God pours out his spirit. That's what I want to see, but that is not what is prophesied. That is not what the scriptures say is going to happen. Please believe me. I don't believe me. That was a bad thing to say. Don't believe me. Believe the scripture. We have the prophetic word confirmed. Hmm. It's interesting that the prophetic word also tells us that as we near the end, the prophetic events would be clearer and the line of events would, would be understood and you would see we would see the converging of the events to the point where we would understand what was spoken long ago and ha literally have the interpretation of it because it would be playing out before our eyes. In Daniel chapter 12, the Lord told Daniel to shut the things that he had been given up in a book and he he wanted to know when they were going to happen. Three occasions in chapter 12, he asked, Lord, when is this going to happen? What's it going to look like? And, the, and three times the Lord said, it's not for you. Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 through 10 is one of those times. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? In other words, what's it going to look like? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The words that Daniel were given would be shut up until the end. At the end, there would be understanding. Another one of those occasions in chapter 12 is they would be shut up until the time of the end when people would go to and fro and knowledge would be, in, be increased. To and fro could be the, the incredible ways that we travel nowadays. <laughs> to and fro on the earth could go anywhere in a day. But it also means to and fro in the scriptures, in the scrolls. And knowledge would increase, the understanding of the word of God, the understanding of the prophetic events. And so those deniers, those deniers 
who would say, you know, there's this great revival that's coming, deny things that are so clear from Ezekiel chapter 36 onward. In chapter 36, the Lord speaks to the mountains. He says, it tells Ezekiel, speak to the mountains and say to the mountains, prepare yourself for my people, for your people, for the people of Israel will soon come home. Then he speaks, has Ezekiel speak to uh, Israel and say to the children of Israel, get ready, I'm going to bring you home to the mountains of Israel. And so that would happen. That happened. It happened. It happened in the last century. It happened after World War II, 1945, being a Shemitah year, the final year of a Shemitah cycle. Uh, in 246, Israel came back in droves, finally recognized in 1948 as a nation, and the last generation began. However you count that last generation, it began. The prophetic word is sure. It is accurate. We see it unfolding. We have seen it unfold. We also know from Ezekiel chapter 38 that after that had happened, after he has brought them home, after they have become strong, after they have become prosperous, after they have become rich and powerful, then a hook would be set into the jaw of Gog of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. He would be turned around and brought from the north, and with him, with him, would come Gomer and Persia and Put and Cush and Togarma. Beth Togarma, the house of Togarma. And we watched a week ago as, and you can study all of those nations, all of those nations are understood today. Everything north of, of Israel go, goes far north, either magnetic north or straight north, straight north, and you're going to find Russia. You're going to find Gog of Magog, chief prince, chief prince, meaning Rosh, the Rosh of Meshach and Tubal. Uh, Tubal. It's the chief prince, the leader of Meshach and Tubal. And, and these are all uh, the, the, the sons of Japheth that migrated to the north. Gomer, Beth Togarma, the area of Turkey, the area of the Black Sea, south of the Black Sea, east and west of the Black Sea. Turkey, maybe some of the stands. It's all that people. Cush, the Horn of Africa. Includes maybe Ethiopia and Sudan, possibly even Egypt, but Egypt is not mentioned. And put being Libya, they're all there. They're going to be a hook set in their mouth. And here we saw the leader of Russia, the leader of Iran, the leader of Turkey. Coming together to form the alliance. That was prophesied. We have a sure prophetic word. We have a more prophetic word. We have a more sure word than the experience monger word from the false prophets of this day. I'm going to be so bold as just to say they're false prophets. That may make some people angry. I'm sorry. We would have an ever clearing understanding of the end. We have an ever clearing understanding of how Damascus could be destroyed overnight. We have an understanding even of how the great city Babylon, not the mystery Babylon, the whore, but the great city Babylon that deceives the whole world with her sorceries, the pharmakia, and her luxuries saying, I'm, I'm a woman that can't be defeated. I can't, I can't be defeated. And we can see how the, in, in a day, in an hour, in fact, that city can be destroyed. And that city is putting out its own public service announcement saying, get ready to evacuate the city at a moment's notice. And here's how you survive a nuclear detonation. And I believe that is the great city, the representation of everything that Babylon was. We are about to go home. We are about to be called up. We are about to go. Let that sink in, especially as you hear 
these other voices that are either ignoring the fact of this deliverance taking place and the seven years of hell on earth, hell being unleashed on earth. They deny that. They deny that's going to happen. They say we're going to have peace and safety, right? It's just, it's just beyond my imagination. We would have peace and safety because we're going to win the world to Jesus. No, we're not. So what's all that all mean to you? Seek after the truth. Follow hard after the truth. Get into the word of God. Stay true to the word of God. Every day, read the word. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the word of God to you, not by interpretation of man, not by Jim's interpretation, but by what the word itself says, and the Holy Spirit will interpret it for you. He will. And, and I believe you're going to come to the same conclusions because it's so very clear. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not surrendered to him and said, I'm a sinner, and I recognize that you came and died for my sins, being the sinless son of God. You died for my sins in my place. You took my punishment. And then you were raised again on the third day so that I could have life. If you've, if you've not believed that and confessed him as your Lord, do so now. It's time. It really is time. I, I, I can't be any more serious. It's time. and. There's not much of it left, really. Today is the day of salvation, and that's what the scripture says. It is clear as clear can be. Don't reject it. Or you're going to be walking in deception. And that's the warning from the scripture. So you follower of Jesus, take heart. Take heart. Our, our deliverance is, is going to happen. When? I don't know. I don't know. Is it going to be Ab 9 or 10? We can't even agree on what days Ab 9 and 10 are. Is it the 6th and 7th of August? Is it the 8th and 9th of August? Is it, is it this calendar or the other? You know what? If it's the one, if it's two calendars, it's already gone by. If it's another, it's about to approach. If it's another, it's still a month away. You know what? That's even part of the confusion. And the Lord is not the author of confusion. We are getting close. We are getting close. Father, help us to stand strong in these days, even as we know that the deception will increase and the weight of oppression will increase, and yet we can still be of good cheer, even though it gets harder and harder and harder, more difficult every day. We choose Jesus Christ, we choose to stand in him. We put on the full armor of God. We stand in good cheer, like a good soldier with his face like flint, looking at the enemy saying, I will not be moved. Because the scripture tells us all who trust in him will not be put to shame and will not be moved. And so we stand in Jesus Christ. Give that kind of strength to us, and we will give you all the praise and all the glory, for you are the king you are the Lord eternal, and we get to be a part of you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray it all. I hope you can say amen to that. Keep looking up. Your redemption is getting nearer and nearer and nearer. And hey, I love you all. Mm -hmm.